What's up, everybody? This is John from Coding Addict, and welcome to another JavaScript Nuggets video. And today's video, we're going to cover what are the callback functions and why it's so important to understand how they work. And essentially, callback function is a function that we pass in as an argument and execute it later. So my assumption is that you are fairly comfortable with this type of code where we have the function and this function is looking for one argument. And then inside of the function body, we just have a console log where we take that value, whatever we pass in, whatever argument we pass in. And then my assumption that it is going to be a string. And then I just use a string method to uppercase. And of course, since I'm console logging, I should see this in the console. And then right after I set up the function, I right away invoke it. I have the function name, and then I just pass in the Peter. And shouldn't be surprised that in a console, of course, we have Peter in uppercase. So now let's take a look at how the callback function is going to work. So first, I'm going to come up with function. And as a sign out, I'll purposely keep using the function keyword instead of the arrow function, because my assumption is that if you're watching this video, the callback function, you might not be familiar with an R function. Now, if you are familiar with arrow functions, then please understand that the same is going to work with arrow functions. And I'll showcase that at the very end of the video. And I'm just going to say that my function name is going to be handle name. And this function is going to be looking for two things. It's going to be looking for the name and also a callback function. And I just referenced that callback function as a parameter. So notice here, I don't have to do anything special. Same how I reference the name. I'm also referencing the callback function. And first in the function, I just come up with some fake functionality where I say that there's going to be a full name and that full name will be equal to a template string. Here I'll access my name argument. So similarly how we're passing in here and then doing something the same we're doing in the handle name. And then I'll just add a Smith. So that's going to be my full name. And what's more interesting, now I'm going to take that callback function, whatever I'm going to be passing in, and I'll invoke it, and I'll pass in the full name. So I save it here. And now, of course, we just need to invoke this function. So we go here with handle name. That's my function. And as far as the name, I'm going to go with Peter again. Now, in order to make my console less busy, I'll comment this one out. And here comes the interesting part, where now, since I'm expecting here a callback function, and I can clearly see that since I'm invoking it inside of the function body, I can pass in my make uppercase. And essentially what we're doing, we're passing a function as an argument. So we're passing it as a value. And here comes the first gotcha, where you don't want to go with make uppercase and then invoke it. So now you're actually invoking this function here, where we call the handle name. That's not what we want to do. What I want to do is invoke this function inside of that function, inside of the handle name, inside of the function body. Therefore, we just reference the function. We say, yeah, we're passing in make uppercase into the handle name as an argument. And then later in the function body, we invoke it. And the moment I say, check it out. Now I have Peter Smith. Why? Well, because I set up a new variable by the name of full name. And in here, I'm just using the name value. So of course, I can pass in whatever I want over here, and then added Smith. And later, I invoked my callback function. So I said, invoke this function, and then pass in the full name. So now, of course, whatever I have here as a full name gets passed into my make uppercase. So this functionality, of course, is still relevant. Whatever we set up here is still valid. Now, the difference is that we're not invoking this function ourselves. This function gets passed in as an argument and then later executed inside of the function body. And once we understand that, we can keep playing around where I can say some more logic here. And then I'm just going to copy this line of code. And then I'm going to invoke that function, I don't know, five more times, like so. Nothing stops me from doing it. Once I have passed this function as an argument inside of this function, I can set it up however my logic requires it. And as you're looking at it, you're like, well, what's the big deal? We could have easily 
just set up this value to uppercase inside of the handle name instead of going through this whole hassle where we passed in the callback function, then we set it up separately, and only then we have this logic. And technically, you're correct, but what I want you to understand is that, of course, we're not limited to just passing in this make uppercase. I can pass in whatever function I want here because this is just argument that is looking for that callback function. So right below the make uppercase, we can come up with another function where I'm going to say reverse and then string. And same deal. I'm just going to have a parameter by the name of value. So I'm expecting some kind of string here. And I'm going to go with another console log. And in this case, I'll access the value. I'll use the split method, which essentially turns this into array. And then I'm going to go with the reverse. So now we're reversing an array. And then finally, let's join it back to the string. And for the join, I'm just going to pass in empty quotation marks, since I don't want to have the commas. And now you notice that if I copy the handle name, and instead of passing in make to uppercase, I pass in reverse string. Now my value will be different here. Why? Well, because my callback function is different. Now, of course, in line 12, I'm invoking reverse string instead of the make uppercase like I have in the first scenario. Again, this is an argument. We just get the callback function and we say, yeah, I want to invoke this callback function and I'll pass in the full name. And then reverse string is already looking for the value. And of course, we just set up a little bit of logic where we split it, we reverse it and join it back together. And of course, in a console, this is the result that we get. And hopefully this gives you a good idea how much more flexible our applications are when we start implementing the callback functions. And before we continue, let me just address two major gotchas. Now, the one I already covered, where essentially you don't want to invoke this function here, because if you're doing so, then you right away invoke it. Notice here, can I read the property to uppercase of undefined? Now, why is that? Because the make uppercase is looking for that value. And I just invoke it right away here. That's not what you want. What you want is to have a function body. And then inside of that function body, this is where you invoke that function. And as you can clearly see, whatever you name the parameter, that is what you're using later. So here you just pass it in as an argument. But then when you're setting up the function, this is where you come up with the name for that callback function. And then, of course, since it is a function, you can invoke it. So sky is the limit. You can call this taco and burrito or vegan food truck. It doesn't really matter. Now, common convention is using the CB, but you don't have to. So that's the first one, something we already covered, but it is very, very important because I get a lot of student questions about that. And the second is the fact that you can pass in here function directly, meaning you don't need to set it up as a reference. Now, again, I'll start with a simple function, meaning with a regular function keyword. But later, of course, I will show you also how we can set it up as a arrow function. So in here, if I'm going to go with handle name and I'll pass in Susan, instead of passing it the reference, I can simply go with my function. Again, we are not invoking it here. I just pass in a function. And in here, you can add the name, you can omit the name. It doesn't really matter since, again, you're accessing it later here in a function body. And for the time being, I'm just going to say console log and then whatever gets passed in. So I go with function, I'll say value. And now, of course, I'll simply have Susan Smith in a console. So I'm not doing anything. I'm just taking my callback function and then I'm console logging whatever value gets passed in. And if you're familiar with arrow functions, we can rewrite this in the following way, where I'm going to go with my arrow function. And we can make it even a one liner if you want, where we simply go with log, and then we're looking for the value. And you'll notice that again, the value will be the same thing. This is the function that I pass in. And then somewhere in that function body, I have the logic where I handle the callback function. And even though these were somewhat very simple examples, 
the reason why it's so important for you to understand how the callback functions work is because they are used all over the place. They're used in the JavaScript language. So you'll use them a lot in array methods, for example, map, filter, find and reduce. Also, they're used when you're setting up the set timeout in JavaScript, when you're setting up the event listeners in JavaScript. And this is just scratching the surface. So now let's take a look at the event listeners. And hopefully this is going to give you a good idea why it's so important to learn them. And trust me, even later, when you work with libraries like react, like node, callback functions are all over the place. And in my scenario, I have in the HTML, a button with a class of BTN. And now I simply want to access that button. So I'm going to go with BTN that is equal to a document, then query selector. And then of course, I'm looking for the BTN. And we are familiar where we can go with BTN. And then we can add the event listener. Now event listener is a function that is looking for two arguments. It's looking for the name of the event, which now of course, of course, is a click event. And second is that callback function. So of course, it has some logic under the hood, where again, it invokes it later. So we don't invoke it right away. And of course, we are not responsible for setting up the logic, but we are responsible for setting up that callback function. So if I go here, and in this case, I'll write away pass in my function, just like I did in my last example here. And I'm going to go with function. And now whatever I'll set up in my function body will be invoked when we click the button. Again, there's some logic under the hood that just takes that callback function and invokes it when we click the button. But the idea is the same where, again, we pass in our callback function. So we don't invoke it right there and then. In this case, we invoke it when we click on a button. Again, let's go with simple hello world. And you'll see that, of course, once we save, as I start clicking the button in a console, I'll all the time see the hello world. So hopefully this gives you a good idea how we set up a callback function, as well as why it's so important to learn it. Again, the main idea is that instead of invoking function right there and then you pass it in the argument, and then inside of your function body, you decide when this gets invoked. And when you talk about the JavaScript language or the libraries, a most common setup is going to be following where you'll have to pass in the callback function and it's going to get invoked under hood. But whatever logic you'll set up inside of that callback function, of course, it will be invoked whenever you click on a button, whenever you're iterating over the items, the timeout. And hopefully you get the gist.